Hello, everyone. I'm just going to wait for Andrea, our interpreter, to uh, join us. Hi, hi, Andrea. Um, hello, everyone. Uh, I wanted to welcome you to uh, IDA screening series. Um, this amazing conversation we're going to have um, about disclosure. Um, before we begin, um, I'm just going to uh, start off with some introductions. My name is Cassidy Diamond. I am the Public Programs and Events Manager here at IDA. I am coming to you from Los Angeles uh, on the unceded land of the Tongva and Chumash people who have been stewards of this generation, of this land for generations. Um, I'd like to thank our media sponsor, IndieWire, uh, who is uh, our me media support for Screening Series. Uh, screening Series also comes to you with support from KCRW. Um, you can watch all of our films if you're an IDA or AMPUS member at documentary.org slash screening series. And all of our conversations are available um, to the general public. Um, so we're so excited to have you all here, uh, but you didn't come here to see me. So I'm just going to start off here by bringing up um, our amazing moderator, Travel Anderson. Uh, they are a journalist, podcast host, and all around everything. So Travel, welcome. Thank you so much for leading us in this discussion. Thanks so much, Cassidy. Um, and they also didn't come to hear me run my mouth. So I'm going to uh, introduce our panel from the film Disclosure. We have our director and producer, Sam Fetter, with us. We also have executive producer and one of the film's participants, Laverne Cox, um, as well as the one and only Yancey Ford, who's also uh, in the film. Thank you all so much for joining us. Um, Sam, I'm going to start with you um, as our director. Talk to us a little bit about like how, how we got here, how we got to the final product that is Disclosure. Where did you um, get the initial idea to explore trans representation on film via a, a doc film? Unmute. Hi, Travel. Hi. <laughs> nice to see you. Um, Thank you all for being here. Thanks, Cassidy. Thanks, IDA. And Andrea, I tend to speak fast. So if I'm speaking too fast, please give me a signal and I'll slow down. Um, so how did it all start? Um, mm -hmm. Well, you know, I think it, we, we, by looking at the past, we can understand so much about the present and plan better for the future. And, you know, there were two documentaries that look at the past, which deeply changed my relationship to the media when I saw them. Um, the first was Ethnic Notions made by Marlon Riggs, and that was in the late 80s, I think 1987. And that was about the representation of black people in film. And the other one I saw was called The Celluloid Closet, mid 90s, I think 95. And that was about gay and lesbian people in film. And I was always curious about what that history might look like for trans people. Right? What would the history of trans representation look like? And what could it tell us about our current society? But until I made disclosure, I had really turned away from mainstream media um, because it made me feel so horrible about myself and so many of the people and issues that I cared about. You know, one of the first images I saw of a trans person I think was Dill in The Crying Game and that image of her boyfriend seeing her naked body for the first time, you know, he swiftly strikes her across the face and then he vomits for almost 40 seconds of screen time. And, you know, that image certainly resurfaces whenever I have a romantic interest. So, you know, I stopped looking at mainstream media, but then mm -hmm. fast forward to 2014 and trans visibility was increasing and, and mainstream society was talking about us more than ever before. And there were two things that were really disconcerting to me about how the media was framing the issue. They, the media seemed to be insinuating that visibility was the ultimate goal for the trans movement and that trans people were something new. And I felt compelled to give trans and non-trans people more context to understand these changes that were happening in the culture, to have a sense of our history and how we got to this point of visibility. And it felt really particularly important to foreground the fact that visibility is a means to an end, right? It's not the ultimate goal. So I felt there was more to the story than the public was seeing and talking about. So I wanted to tell that story. 
Thank you for that. Uh, Laverne, um, I, if, if I remember correctly, as the story goes, in terms of how you met Sam and figured out that he was working on this film, you woke up one day and went to an event at Outfest, right? Where Sam was presenting um, some of the work that they were doing. Um, what do you remember from, from that presentation, from what Sam was putting forward, and what made you want to be involved in this project? Well, hi, Travel. Um Honestly, I just had a conversation with my manager about what I wanted to do next. And I, and I was really, we had talked um, specifically about doing something around trans history. Mm -hmm. And I've always had always wanted to do a sort of trans celluloid closet. And I happened to walk into the Outfest um, presentation and, and, and Nick, my friend Nick uh, Adams was there and said, oh, I'm so glad you're here. There's a guy who's doing a presentation. It's the trans celluloid closet. And I was like, okay. And what sort of blew my mind about Sam's presentation was the depth of the research. I learned so much that I didn't know and I thought I knew a lot already. And I was just amazed at how much research he'd already done. And I was just really compelled by, by the research and by, by, by the clips and how far back they went. And then we met afterwards and I was just then immediately impressed by him and, and Amy um, Shoulder, our um, producer. And we met, I think about a week later and I just fell in love with him and um, said, what can I do to help? And, and here we are three years later. I love that. And then Yancey, you know, as one of the film participants, um, you know, Sam and Laverne, you both have spoken about um, in this conversation and prior about like, you know, wanting to have a conversation about trans representation on screen. Um, Yancey, what made you say yes as a film participant, as someone to, to put yourself right in, in this story and in this exploration of trans history? Sure. Um, well, well, first I thought that, um, I, I knew that I would be in really good hands with Sam and Amy and Laverne um, in terms of the, the story that they were trying to tell and, and the history that they were trying to um, to uncover and and share with the world. Um, I also felt uh, an obligation really to the community to participate because there's so little representation of trans masculinity um, in the culture and I wanted to um, you know, I wanted to take part because I feel like, you know, um, having a chance to talk about the history of trans representation and how it affected me, um, um, you know, could only help other people, um, and especially young people who are dealing with the, you know, transphobia and, and trans violence today. Mm -hmm. Sam, I'm wondering, as you were, were starting this journey, was there something, some aspect of trans history, trans representation on screen that like you knew without a doubt from the beginning had to be in the film? Ooh, that's a good question. I haven't been asked that one before. Oh, that's so hard, right? This many years later when I've just been in it so deeply. So before I started, was there anything that I thought had to be in the film? I mean, I think going back to what the reason I made it, right? Mm -hmm. the, the whole reason was about the paradox of visibility, right? And that with visibility comes so much vulnerability. Um, and just having a more nuanced understanding of how that operates in our culture. Because whenever a marginalized community gets mainstream attention, backlash ensues. And, I, you know, I'd seen this as an activist, like so many, so much of the time, whatever kind of activist issue I was working on, it, visibility always was sort of front and center of, of what the movement was trying to achieve. And it, I just wanted to understand like how social justice movements could be more strategic perhaps, mm -hmm. right? And not have the backlash be inevitable. Mm -hmm. So from the beginning, that was really where my heart was at. And so that I knew was gonna be part of it for sure. Mm -hmm. And then did you think about, um, you know, there's so many different references in the film um, from, you know, the Jerry Springer days all the way through, you know, um, Alfred Hitchcock and his foolishness and, you know, everything else all the way up to, to Pose, right? What we see now in the L word, uh, Generation Q. Is there, as you've seen like audiences grappling with the film, has there been something that has stuck out most um, based on, on your observations of other people's observations that, that seems to be like the most salient thing that people are taking away? Like clips wise or emotionally? Like clips wise or, or even emotional, yeah. 
I mean, clips wise, it's, it's very generationally particular, right? Mm -hmm. There's a certain generation that just like Ace Ventura, absolutely. If they respond to that, they remember that they're ashamed. Um, I mean, I'm not interested in shaming people, but I do think it's, it is interesting when people walk away, just being like, I just never thought about this. And that, and the sort of takeaway of that is an element of shame of, of realizing you had ingested all this and never had a critical lens. Mm -hmm. Um, so Ace Ventura is a huge one for, for a generation a little younger than me. So I'm 45. So I think it's like people in their early 30s, 35-ish. Mm -hmm. And then my generation, talk shows across the board. Mm. Talk shows, talk shows, talk shows. I mean, so many of us grew up coming home from school, four o'clock, turn on the TV, and it's talk shows everywhere. Um, so emotionally, it's a lot about this sort of reckoning with oneself of mm -hmm. what what did all these images do to my subconscious? You know, hearing people talk about that and how like this is just this is kind of just brought in a new filter. Doesn't seem like the right word, but it's just another optional lens to look through that, mm -hmm. that people didn't have access to before, and that's been very meaningful to hear. Yeah, I mean, Yancy, I feel like you have <laughs> one of the. Um, you, you, your, your segment along with uh, Susan Stryker um, in this conversation about like how racism and transphobia are often interconnected, um, mm -hmm. particularly when we look at our film history, um, is a clip and is a, a, a conversation point that I see popping up in, in my particular spaces. Um, why was it important for you to, to make that connection in particular um, when, we, when we look back at, at the ways trans people and Black folks in particular, right, have been mm -hmm. Uh, rendered on screen. Yeah, it was important for me to, to, to talk about that point because I think that, you know, um, when we try to figure out now or when we try to, 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 to figure out how we've gotten to where we are um, with so much transphobia and so much violence directed at trans, you know, trans people of color, trans women of color specifically, um, it's important to, to, to look back and see like all of the places where those clues and those ideas got planted and you know if they get planted in in you know in the father of, of cinema film cinema right by deep w griffith and th then it grows there and then it but it also starts to manifest in other places by people who you know are inspired by or want to emulate the work that um some of these early filmmakers did so you know for me it was really important to to, to make sure that people understood that they go hand in hand because, you know, the violence goes hand in hand. It's, tr it's, it's true. Like if you had, if you asked yourself the question today, you know, um, you know, is, is cinema representation of trans people and, and people of color, um, you know, have anything, have anything to do with the violence against, you know, trans people, then th the answer would be yes, because mm -hmm. you can go back to the origins of these problematic images and begin to understand um, how long they have been with us. Laverne, as, as an actress, as, you know, someone who's part of, of telling stories, of sharing narratives, um, I know you were like very hands-on and part of, of the production of this, but I'm wondering when you look at the final product of the film, is there something that resonates with you most as, as an actress um, that perhaps wasn't something you were considering prior to the film? Uh, in terms of the ways our stories have been told? I mean, there's so many things. I think what is so unique and special about Disclosure is that it really centers <clears throat> the voices of trans people the, and the ways in which we look, right? I think what is different and what has been so cathartic um, hearing from people watching the film is that they, um, particularly a lot of trans folks have felt their perspectives validated in a deep sense because there's such a diverse um, group of trans people on screen ultimately telling our own stories. And so I think that piece is really crucial. And I think too, the aha moment from so many um, folks who've watched around how they've sort of been indoctrinated through mm -hmm. film. And I, I think we're in this historical moment now, I think it's incumbent upon us to think critically about the ways in which we can be propagandized by media. There's such a, um, thinking a lot about how there's like, you know, sort of just two different medias, right? There's like a right media and a left media and like 
the, with varying degrees of propaganda? And how do we as viewers develop a critical awareness and critical thinking to sort of dissect the images that we are seeing? Disclosure does it specifically with trans folks, but I, I, what's been beautiful for me is seeing viewers really grapple with the ways in which all film and television can serve as, as sort of propaganda if we allow it to. And so then as viewers, we become, hopefully bec can become more critical viewers. And then as, as, as filmmakers, as people who are telling the stories, we, the, the responsibility um, deepens in terms of how we are telling stories. I think once we have a certain kind of critical awareness, and I think disclosure invites that kind of critical awareness in it. And, and it's been really exciting to see folks sort of, um, you know, particularly filmmakers say, this has changed how I view film and how I'm gonna make film going forward. That's really exciting to me. Mm -hmm. Sam, could you talk a little bit more about like the, the decision to have, you know, all of the folks that we see on screen, right, talking about these different images, be trans folks, but also kind of the production model, right, on, on the back end. Um, could you talk to us a little bit about that? Yeah, I mean, from the beginning of this project, um, when I realized that there had, there was no other document, right, this, or let me back up a second, since I, you know, I talked about ethnic notions and so like closet a little bit. And so I, I looked into how they made their films. I spoke to the filmmakers of Celluloid Closet actually, and both of those films were based on books, right? And so mm -hmm. I thought, okay, I just need to find the book on trans representation and then I can get started. And very quickly I realized nothing existed. There was one tiny book, like maybe that thick, made, I think it came out in 2006 and it's called Transgender on Screen. Um, by this guy named John Phillips, and at best, it's problematic, right? That's that's a compliment, right? It, so <laughs> I had to toss that away, and I had to make a decision that I was gonna, you know, do this. And I'm not a trained historian, I'm not a trained archivist, um, but also I I did know that, you know, creating a history is really ethically precarious, right? We know that from mm. from what we've studied and how we study it and how it's created. So. This, uh, this, the data that I was going to collect that would be the primary document of the film could not just be what I thought was important. So from the beginning, I made a list of every trans person I knew who has worked on one side of the camera or the other, and that's where my research started, right? I just got a backpack from B&H Photo and got a light kit and a mic, and you know, it was just me, and then had everything rigged up on you know, really high. And I traveled around the country and spoke and did these interviews, these research interviews, and that's how I collected the beginning. And it just, it, it was not, not even something I really considered otherwise. Of course, it was gonna be about, it was gonna be trans people, right? It had to be trans people telling the story because this is about how these images have made us feel, right? Mm -hmm. And that, that's what the nexus of this film, that's the heart of this film. I think, you know, that's why it's not a survey film, right? There's like this emotional narrative that carries us through the story because it's based in people's anecdotes. You know, it, making a conventional film, which is not really my preference, but when we decided to make a very conventional style, like I, I knew it, I had to figure out a way to show the story, right? Not just tell it, not just have people talking about it. So it had to be based in personal stories. Not only that, but it, trans people are the experts of their own history. Like, so there's really no other reason for anyone else to be in the film. Likewise, you know, the way, the ways in which we make all of our decisions behind the scenes are deeply informed by our ideologies. Mm -hmm. And so again, that had to be trans people making those decisions. And only a trans person is going to have a particular sensitivity to, to how, to frame another trans person. There's just certain things that perhaps you could teach someone, right? Like certain sensitivities that a trans person might have in terms of how they're lit or how they're framed. But it's so much nicer to not have to have that learning curve on set. Um, and so we prioritized hiring a trans person in every key position on set in our production. And when we couldn't hire a trans person, we trained one. And so we had a fellowship and it was incredible. Um, some of our fellows have gone on to screen their films across the country. Uh, one got a job at Netflix, another sold a screenplay. Um, our fellows are phenomenal. And both, the, both searching for trans crew for the key positions and for the fellows, we did an international search. It was not easy. I mean, there was a lot of time, a lot of resources, 
but it, it was absolutely one of the essential values of this project. You know, it's like we get to choose where we put our energy. And that was absolutely, that was a place that we put our intention and our energy because it was integral to doing this, to doing this right. And to, and to knowing that it would like without a doubt, make the project as special as it is. You know, mm -hmm. I feel like that, that energy, that intention, that sensitivity is felt by the viewer, you know? Um, mm -hmm. Yancy, I mean, I, to that, to Sam's point, mm -hmm. I feel, I felt like when I came onto set for my set of interviews, that the, the energy on set felt different to me. Um, and I think in part because I knew that there was like family on, on set. How did it feel for you when you came into that space? How, in what ways do you think having um, a, a, a diversity, right, of trans folks um, on, on the production team throughout all these different levels mm -hmm. um, aided you as a participant in mm -hmm. the process? Well, I think it started like when I arrived at the location, like before I was even on set, you know, the, the person who greeted me at the door um, was trans. And it, there, there was just a sense of, you know, I walked, into, I walked into that space and instead of, you know, doing what I normally do, which is trying to get an inventory of who's there, you know, because when you find yourself in, in unfamiliar places, one of the things you do as a trans person is you look for potential allies in the event that you, you know, in the event that something goes wrong and you need, you know, and you need someone to either turn to for help or allyship or whatever. Um, I walked into that space and I realized that, you know, I didn't actually have to be concerned. I didn't actually have to be, you know, worried that someone was going to say something transphobic or, you know, make a snide remark or, you know, or ignore me and pretend that I wasn't there. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I felt just incredibly seen um, from the first moment I, I got there until, you know, they, um, they put me in the car to go back to my hotel. It was, um, you know, the most, uh, it was the most welcoming, warm, uh, professional, skilled, um, you know, incredible set that I found myself on. Um, and, you know, all of that means that you can sort of relax into yourself and be present. And being able to be present as you were talking about the things like, you know, I, I was talking about things that I had seen in Disclosure that I, you know, grew up watching these images and hadn't actually registered. You know, I had, you know, for a long time, you know, didn't have a proper or rather a whole analysis of Boys Don't Cry. So, you know, there were lots of things that I was learning while I was watching Disclosure. And then to talk about that, you know, just in the company of people from, from the community, just for me, it made for me, it made it possible to, to have the conversation. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Laverne, you've spoken about um, mm -hmm. sometimes, you know, when, when trans folks go on sets, the, the need to do that extra layer of, of work, of education, of all of that to, to feel like you can ultimately be able to do um, your job. Um, for you, and I know you've, you've executive produce and been you know featured in documentaries before i'm wondering how do you feel like this sort of structure that you all were able to do on the disclosure set impacted and impacts how you you know move through the industry going forward with the types of projects that that you find yourself part of and then theoretically right how the the industry might might shift and change Gosh, I, it just makes, it warms my heart to hear Yancey say all of that about um, his experience on our set. It just, it, it, I, I thank you for sharing that, Yancey. That was really beautiful. That's certainly what we all wanted to, um, for every, um, every cast member. You know, over the years, I've experienced a, a number of things. And because of my training as an actor, I've, I've been, I've sort of been trained to sort of like, you know, I've been misgendered on sets, you know, I've been misgendered and it's like, sometimes there's a space to make a correction and sometimes I need to just focus on what I'm there for. And so much of my work over the years has been like, either um, if it's appropriate to have an educational moment with collaborators, then to do that. And then other times to just like sort of dismiss something that's been said so I can focus on my work. So I can like not be derailed, right? I must not let anything keep me from being completely and utterly um, prepared and focused when the director says action. And, you know, it's really, it's, an, it's deep to think about that. It's deep to think about the, um, 
having to sort of shove that down. And, and all, the, all the times I've had to do that over the years just to get through um, work and not, um, and not be a problem and not be perceived as a problem or being pre perceived as being difficult. Um, but I definitely, as a producer, and I'm working on um, producing, you know, scripted content going forward. And I did, and we were, I was in a, in a Zoom meeting about a movie that we're um, developing right now. And there was a storyline and I was like, I don't know if we can say this post-disclosure, right? So even though, you know, we were talking about the film, you know, pre-disclosure being out and I've been working on this film for years, but now I think, um, I think the conversation has necessarily changed as a result of our film. And so the way that I work going forward can change and this can become a reference for how we can go forward um, doing the work um, in front of and behind the camera. I'm thinking as a producer, is there a way to incorporate um, some sort of fellowship program, some sort of training program for all of the projects that you going forward? And so these are, these are conversations I've certainly had with my manager and with some of my collaborators already. Um, and I don't know how it's gonna shake out, but I definitely, this, I feel changed by this project. And I think necessarily the industry has to change. When we, when, we, when we know better, we do better. And disclosure gives us the opportunity to know better. And so we necessarily must do better when it comes to uh, telling our stories and, and who tells our stories and how, and then the, the levels of safety that people can feel and should feel uh, um, on sets um, is really, really important. And I think one of the things that, you know, uh, even before, you know, my formal participation in the film um, that I've loved about what you put together, Sam, is this idea. I feel like in this industry, we always hear people just talk about how, you know, folks of color, trans people, it, it said queer people aren't qualified, don't have the training, don't have the know-how. And by having this sort of system, right, you all contribute to the training, right, and the education. Um, and, and not to mention, Sam, you said that you all did kind of an international search to find, you know, as many trans folks as possible. Um, could you talk a little bit about, about that process of, of finding people, sourcing people, and how you were able to make, you know, judgments about qualifications, if you will, for members of our community who may not have access to, right, you know, the traditional forms of education that perhaps an IDA audience, right, might have? Right. Um... Thank you, and, and that's a good question. I, for, it was national, not international. I would, gotcha. It, next time, next time it'll be international. <laughs> um, so, you know, I think, I think over or close to 150 trans people contributed to this project, um, which is really exciting to me. When we first started to look for key people, we did, we wanted people with experience, right? Mm -hmm. We wanted this film to, have a certain look, you know, to be a, to, to be, we wanted it to be excellent. Um, so we did, we did look for people for a particular experience. Um, and that mostly, you know, we kind of started with, you know, with, you know, who Laverne knew, you know, who people knew in the industry. I reached out to other friends, you know, it kind of kept that little smaller. Mm -hmm. And I pretty much found the trans crew um, through people I knew. Right, who had worked with other trans people. Then doing the fellowship, that I wanted, I, th I didn't want there to be any, any, any bar, right? I wanted anyone who was interested, who was passionate and who wanted to pursue this career, they, no, people did not have to have any experience. And in fact, if you had too much experience, I kind of felt like, all right, you already have your foot in the door <laughs> a little bit. Mm -hmm. uh, so the, for the process for the fellows is really just spending a lot of time talking, getting a sense, like feeling out how they're going to be on set. And if it was this something they really were passionate about pursuing or did they just want to get close to Laverne? You know, I had to be careful about that too. Mm -hmm. um, so that was, <laughs> it's true. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, so that was sort of the initial process. Um, you know, so much of working with people on set is personalities, right? You can, you can teach a skill. People can have a certain amount of experience and excellence that you can see, you know, but it's really about how are you, you going to feel with them. And so I did that with everyone, right? The fellows and the trans crew, but even more so with the non-trans people we hired. That I was, I spent, ooh, I just started to get some feedback. 
okay, it stopped. Um, that had a few more layers to it. You know, I would do the initial phone call or Skype, then I would meet them in person, then I would want them to meet some other people, you know, that we were working with. I really did not, I mean, I knew there were going to be mistakes, people were going to mess up, it happens, but I wanted to kind of get a sense of how, how are people going to react when they make a mistake, right? Are they going to make it all about them? Or are they just going to, you know, say they're sorry and move on and do better next time? Um, and when I say mistakes, I mean misgendering, you know, something along those lines or, or saying something problematic. I think someone, I think I got misgendered once on set and I think that's the only time anyone got misgendered. So it, it worked out pretty well. Um, but it was also really important that our ment our, the people, the non-trans people were really excited in the mentorship. Right? Mm -hmm. I didn't want that to be something, I wanted that to be something that they were particularly invested in, um, and they were, and that just blew my mind. You know, anytime I turned around, anytime there was a break, someone was drawing a diagram, you know, and, or you know, giving a particular lesson, lighting someone, you know, it was, it was incredible. And so the, our, our mentees, no, our mentors were, were phenomenal, and that was really important to me because I wanted the experience for every trans person to be unlike anything they have felt before. You know, like similar to Yancy's experience of walking in and suddenly being like, oh, I don't have to be as on guard as I usually am. Um, to what it would feel like for a young trans person to be on a set where they are valued, right? Mm -hmm. And their identity is centered. I certainly never had that as a young person. Um, and so that, I, that was really, really important. And I, I think we achieved that. Mm -hmm, definitely. Yancy, um, there, I feel like there are so many different um, potential conversation points that Disclosure uh, uh, presents, whether it's in terms of, of what we actually see on screen or how the film was put together behind the scenes. Um, mm -hmm. From your vantage point, I'm wondering if there's something about the film, maybe it's in the film, that you think is is kind of paramount for folks not to to overlook or miss in terms of what they're what they're taking away from the film. Sure, um, I think that for me, you know, again, for part of my lens is generational, but I think that it that it sort of is a theme that recurs throughout the film. I think it's important for people to to realize how often humor is used to disguise um, transphobia and and really kind of trans. Um, you know, like what, 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 what borders on visual trans violence or violence toward trans people. I think that that is um, like one of the most important lessons of, um, of this film, because like many other, um, you know, forms of, of discrimination, if people can get you to laugh at something, it feels easier to accept it. Um, and with so much of, of the programming that I, you know, sort of came home and put on, turn on the TV and watch the Jeffersons and, you know, like all sorts of other, you know, programs that are featured and deconstructed in Disclosure, um, I, I never thought about, you know, those things until I saw them when I, when I watched the film. Um, and so I think it's really important for, for folks to, um, to be on guard when, when someone is trying to make you laugh at someone you need to interrogate that impulse. You need to interrogate that desire to have you um, make someone else the butt of the joke because almost always, you know, the expense um, is, is, you know, is that the person who, um, at, at whom the joke is directed, but the damage is so much, is so much greater than just, than just one joke. The damage is done to that person, but the damage is also done to you. Um, and if you don't, you know, keep that in mind, I think that's how you wind up, you know, with, with transphobic people who think they're not transphobic and then all of a sudden you're like, actually, no, you're, you're pretty transphobic. <laughs> Laverne, do you want to- No, I'm something? living. Yeah, I'm living for that, um, Yancy. That is so crucial and so important. And I think I've always said, I'm not sure if I said it publicly, that, um, you know, I, there, there, cause there've been so many conversations around comedians and, and all the things that they, people, you know, free speech, or, you know, we shouldn't be censoring people. And free speech is something, everyone has freedom of speech, but freedom, um, freedom of speech has consequences, right? And I think when we're talking about marginalized people, those consequences are often experienced by those marginalized communities, right? A very privileged, 
you know, multimillionaire comedian making a joke at the expense of a community. It's like, well, he should be able to say whatever he wants to say. And then like, meanwhile, people are making similar jokes while they commit violence against trans people on the street. And um, the, the legislative assaults that we've seen over the years, right, against trans people, like just this particular administration has been like sort of legendary with all of the sort of legislative assaults against trans folks on a federal level. And then we can go to the state so that there are consequences. And so it's, yes, people have the right to say whatever they want. And I'm, I'm, I'm a huge advocate of artists being able to express, to express themselves. But what I hope is that um, with this film, people can begin to think about the consequences of our expression as artists and um, have a sense of, um, well, it shouldn't, it shouldn't be, it can't just be about me having the right to say whatever I want to say, because what is my, I guess, my responsibility? What is my social responsibility, even if I want to make people laugh, even as we really desperately need to laugh, um, particularly at this historical moment? Laverne, do you feel like, do you, do you, I feel like I, I follow the Disclosure social media pages, and I feel like every day there's retweets and reshares of, like, people's own individual aha moments and like the things that they've been learning um, as they grapple with the film. Do you feel like folks are are latching on to some of these lessons and doing that kind of self interrogation to to, you know, to extend right that which you all talk about in the film outside of the film to to everyday lives. I think so. I'm seeing it a lot. It's beautiful. I see those retweets as well, and it heartens me. One of the more recent ones I saw was a moment um, in the film where I talk about a clip, and I, and I ask the question, I wonder if these people think about the trans people watching. And the person who tweeted said, I don't think they do think about the trans people watching. Mm -hmm. and, I, and, and I hope now that maybe um, creators and artists will begin to think about the trans people watching, but not just us, how... Um, they may or may not be perpetuating something that um, puts us in danger, puts our lives in danger and perpetuates ideas that put our lives in danger. So, um, I mean, there's been so many, so many things that have literally brought me to tears and some of my colleagues in the business too, like other fellow actors who've been so incredibly supportive and have just been so genuinely moved by the work and to just, and just to, it's such a privilege as an artist to, to have one person, you know, be moved by the work that you're doing and to have all of the incredible response. I mean, I think about something that Tracy Ellis Ross just, uh, you know, she was randomly doing a, you know, a live conversation with someone and then and, and disclosure came up and I was just like, oh, hey, hey girl. <laughs> uh, and so just like things like that, where people have just genuinely been moved. And so they um, are talking about it and that's really, really exciting. And so, you know, what does it mean like to make the world a better place? I think this is what we all are sort of striving to do as artists right now. And it's, it's this, you know, I'm, I'm at a loss in so many ways around what, what is happening politically. But when I think about the work that artists are doing and, and, and can do and the possibility for change there, I get really, really excited. Um, and I just have to also acknowledge that Yancey, and I'm, correct me if I'm wrong, Yancey, you are one of three openly trans people who's ever been nominated for an Oscar in any category, <laughs> to my <laughs> knowledge, like in the history of the Academy Awards. And I just, I'm like, can we just take, can we just pause and say work? Uh, <laughs> um, pause and say congratulations on that. And just, wow, have you thought, I'm, I'm sorry, I, have you thought about that, Yancey? I mean, you're just, sometimes we're just moving forward with the work. Have you thought about the fact that you're one of three people in the history of the Academy Awards who's openly trans, who's ever been nominated? <laughs> no, I, I have to be honest with you. I, when, I, when I let myself think about it a little bit, it's just so enormous that it's just like, I mean, I wanted to make, I wanted to make a good movie um, that honored, you know, that honored my brother and that brought up, you know, issues about racial, uh, racialized violence in, in, our, in our criminal justice system. I had no idea that just, just by, by setting out to do, you know, that, that story that I would wind up making history and it's just the kind of thing that um i'm just i'm so incredibly humbled to um to feel like in, in some small way i'm repping our community um you know um, by having achieved that 
And then there's the part of me that's just like, okay, you got, you, you have to just turn that off because you'll never be able to work again if you keep thinking about the fact that you know that, that you are one of three, the three openly trans people. I just, it's just one of those things that's like, you know, it's it's kind of like getting the student of the month award, except it's much much larger scale. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and I well, sort of I would say so. <laughs> I don't know. It's just, it's, it's mind blowing. It, it really is mind blowing. Um, and I try to live up to, um, in, in whatever small way I represent the community. Uh, I try to, I try to do that well at all times. Mm, that's beautiful. I can relate to the enormity of it. Um, so yeah. yeah. Um, thanks for sharing that. I appreciate it. <laughs> yeah. Imagine I mean, how many people who aren't, who weren't out, you know, who were nominated over the years, you know, exactly. And that's the thing about history, right? It's like it happens in the present tense and then it happens again in the future. Mm. So we know about, you know, the three, the three people now, who knows when that number will change. And certainly, it certainly will change. And I, and I look forward to that day as well, because, you know, I, I, I know that just like you guys uncovered so much that eventually history will uncover mm. um, the very first trans person to be nominated for an Oscar. Um, and, and that will be a glorious day. But until then, I'm proud to have you as our representative, for sure. <laughs> uh, as we wrap up, Sam, I just wanted to come back to you. I know that the film, um, one of the important parts of, of what you all have done there here is about uh, making sure that the community is able to see the film, the social impact, right, of the film. Um, could you talk to us just a little bit about the ways in which, you know, ideally, folks will extend the conversation that you all start in the film, you know, offline. Yeah, our impact campaign, which, you know, involves distribution, uh, you know, outside of Netflix and, and how we will partner with organizations who have an interest in the topics, right, and, and how the film could be of use to the work they're doing. So our impact campaign includes obviously, you know, the entertainment industry, right? And, and having those partnerships and taking the conversation forward. And, you know, we're already seeing people actually start fellowships. Ryan Reynolds started a fellowship after feeling inspired around, he saw disclosure and he reached out to Laverne and he reached out to Jen. And then we saw later on that he started his own fellowship. So that was really cool. And then we saw like Hale Berry, right? Turn down, like rescind the offer to take the role of playing a trans man. Um, so we're seeing the industry change and that's mind blowing. Um, we also, you know, have a, a educational strategy where we want to get the film to classrooms all across the world. You know, we'll create toolkits around curriculums and, and guides, um, but also in prisons. So if we want to bring the film into prisons, um, we know that, I mean, I, prison abolition is another thing I work on and I'm really passionate about. And particularly, I work with trans people inside who are inside. So getting this film inside to hopefully create more safety for trans people on the inside. Um, and with and kind of like adjacent to that is the judicial system, right? Getting this film to lawyers and to judges. And that has happened as well. So Chase, who's in our film, who's a lawyer, he was telling me that one of his colleagues at the ACLU, who's a non-trans person, watched Disclosure to prepare an argument for representing a trans person. And that was totally one of my dreams from the beginning. Um, and then there's a, a group in California, a group of judges who reached out to Netflix to get some clips to share among each other to educate. So those are the ways in which that, you know, with my activist heart, I'm thrilled to be seeing an impact happen already and expect that to continue. Well, thank you all so much, Sam, Laverne, and Yancey. Thanks so much for your time and for sharing, you know, what you all have put together. Um, I guess I could say what we all have put together yeah. <laughs> um, with Disclosure. Thank Indeed. you. Well. Thanks, Jamal. <laughs>